I would like to invite Jennifer Podmore up to the stage. Uh, she is going to be introducing the next panel. I, I'd probably just invite the whole panel to come up. I know that we're we're running a little bit for, yeah, far behind, and um, and we sort of decided <laughs> yeah. anywhere you guys get the so you all get the comfy seats. After this, um, yeah. you can include like any notes from the day. <laughs> yeah, and then you're gonna introduce yeah. Jennifer Lomachenko. <laughs> yeah, and then you're gonna thank the sponsors. And yeah, you're going to turn, turn that off. So while we were preparing for this panel, we sort of, or, or I will, will give credit that, that this group of people really needs very little introduction and we were really excited about the, the discussion and the dialogue and, and focusing on the time that we have. So we are going to do away with all of the formal introductions of, of each of our panelists and we're gonna get into just a number of, of questions and dialogues uh, to really sort of build upon a lot of the themes that came out through through today and so certainly some of the things that we've been hearing around placemaking is thinking about the community thinking about the third spaces thinking about the planning and the policies that go into creating uh, creating really the Vancouver of, of tomorrow and so when we were thinking about economic revitalization or as we were sort of saying economic prosperity of what comes next and what can we do uh, we didn't want to spend a lot of time talking about how Vancouver has gotten to where it is but the first question for everyone except for Larry because we've got the second question for him is really you know if we are coming into this today as as policymakers and business leaders what is it that you know where are we in terms of Vancouver and what is the opportunity that you see as, as you arrive here and I'll, I'll leave it to anyone but Larry to, <laughs> to answer the first question what is the opportunity of Vancouver yeah I mean I think Vancouver has limitless opportunities I think that uh, being on the West Coast, we're very much on the frontier and have been for a long time. And I think it's a similar uh, situation that you see in San Francisco, for example, that uh, it's often these frontier cities, these cities on the West Coast that lead the way. So uh, Vancouver is a very, very attractive place to be. And I think that will only grow stronger as time goes on. I think that the city is very appealing to people from all over the world. And I think we have a creative community here and a tech community that is going to continue to attract, continue to grow and continue to attract uh, people, not just to work for them, but also to live in Vancouver. Because living in Vancouver is a very attractive place to be. So I think Vancouver uh, is uh, very alluring and very appealing to people. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we can make it even more appealing to people in a little bit. Anyone else? I think we're all up here. Be in doing what we do is because we love the city. There's just no question about it, and I would probably say the same sentiment is right across this entire room. Um, we just listened to a panel that talked about how we can uh, sort of see ourselves as a global leader, but I, I know we didn't want to go into the time machine too much, but I think back to the 1980s when uh, we just uh, uh, saw the expo arrive here, and then very quickly we started to see uh, Don Matrix start distinct software in the basement in, in Burnaby, and that quickly be, became purchased by Electronic Arts. The EA Sports franchises were built here in, in Metro Vancouver, and we ended up creating a fantastically large digital and uh, a video game industry here. Uh, same goes for our movie sector. The, the, the movies that kind of ran away from Hollywood here turned into 21 Jump Street, MacGyver, all these major films and TV series that started going. Now we have this fantastically large film industry and all the ancillary benefits of that, including all the digital and all the different uh, sound production works. And also think about some of the early recording that happened here. Some of the biggest hits of the 1980s were recorded in, in, in recording studios with local Vancouver talent. I don't think we've given ourselves nearly enough credit for just how incredibly uh, outsized our influence as a city and a region is in terms of the world's culture. Um, one of the very first uh, small software companies that uh, began in Gastown uh, was called uh, Consumer Software. They created the prototype that uh, Microsoft ended up buying the entire uh, company and moved all of its staff down to Redmond in the early 1990s, which became the foundation for Outlook, which is now the largest uh, 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 email client used around the world. I mean, again, uh, beginnings in Vancouver. So I think sometimes we have to stop, remind ourselves of just absolutely how, how 
strong we have been on the world stage before we start thinking about where we can be going forward because we, we are really building upon fantastic base with great talent and plus all the things that we admire about the city, which is it's a great place to live, work and play. And I think a lot of the work that we've been doing around reconciliation too, I think is, is going to really advance our city and, we're, and, and, and become that, that global leader. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, uh, hi everybody, I'm loving this format by the way, um, and thank you for hanging in until the end of the day. Um, I'm going to maybe drill in and shake it up a little bit, and just to twist the question in terms of when you said what's the opportunity for Vancouver, but I would say, I think we're at an inflection point, so what is the opportunity, but what is also the risk? And I think that we are at a point where we have a lot of pressures around affordability, around housing, around infrastructure that are appropriately taking up a lot of the air in the room. But what we need to also think about is that we don't get so pressured that we miss the opportunity to invest in our city. And so if you look at some of the past things, and I look forward as to this is the time when we need to be actually also investing in public space. We need to be kind of setting the stage for the future. It's like I used to work with somebody that used to call it cathedral thinking. Um, and it was someone that would you know, set things aside for generations. So it was like green space, building um, public space and parks. I was in Boston uh, a couple days ago when I visited the Boston Commons, and it got me thinking, you know, it was also in Montreal, but it got me thinking about what does public space actually mean to a city? And the legacy was that it was the place where people were able to come and express themselves and have sort of first political dialogue. It's also the places where people connected culturally, socially, sometimes passively, sometimes they're actively involved, um, but they're economic drivers, they're social drivers, they're cultural connections, they're fun, they're vibrant. They help attract people to come and want to live in the city when you're attracting tech talent. Um, and if we lose that because we are overcome by some of the other pressures, I think that's the challenge. So I could go on, but I'm going to pass this on because I know you've got a bunch of questions to ask us. Well, and I guess I'm going to take a different viewpoint because I think we're at great risk of squandering the opportunity that exists in front of us. I firmly believe that government has, an, has the responsibility to create the conditions for businesses to thrive. And I heard the last panel, and I couldn't agree more, that individuals and families are suffering greatly under affordability issues, but businesses, particularly small and medium businesses, which are all of you in the room, are facing the same kind of challenges. You know, we at the Board of Trade did a report in May that showed over a two-year period, the government imposed costs on businesses six and a half billion dollars in additional costs. That's the employer health tax, that's the BC share of the carbon tax, it's additional sick pay, it's a number of layering on of taxes. And so, Walter, to your point earlier, we are not a competitive jurisdiction. And if we do not take action to change that, none of us in the room are going to be here. Talk a little bit about industrial land as well. And people are wondering, what the hell is industrial land? It is where employers grow their businesses. And we do not have enough of it here. 4% is all we have in Vancouver, which is about half of what most comparative cities have. We have a 1% vacancy rate. A lot of reasons for that. But in over a four-year period, we're watching jobs and companies move to places like Calgary and to Washington State because they cannot, you cannot, grow your businesses. So I'm really worried about the road that we're on. I see great potential, but unless government creates the conditions for businesses to thrive, and that's at all three levels, so I'm looking at some of you too, none of us are going to be here anymore. So Larry... Uh, and for anyone who, who maybe doesn't know Larry's background, but so much of the placemaking and what we get to enjoy of Vancouver today is a lot of the work that you put in into place when you were head of planning in Vancouver. But if we were to sort of reimagine, if you were coming into Vancouver today and to, tomorrow was day one uh, of your role in the city of Vancouver, knowing the pressures that we have in terms of availability of housing, attainability, affordability, the need to be able to grow businesses, the pressures that we have, what are some of the things that you would be thinking about in terms of how to make sure that we aren't squandering that opportunity and what you would be thinking about in terms of, of design and development and placemaking? I've come to the conclusion that we are at a moment where we have to change how we think about a number of things. If we don't, we're going to keep arguing that we're losing this, we're losing that, we're losing this, but we're doing the same things all the time. Somebody said earlier that, um, you know, in this city things are siloed. Well, that is a fundamental issue 
in the modern world, and you look at all the people in this room who are not siloed. They're living in a world where silos don't survive. And yet we have government on the one hand, we have development community and the business community on the other hand, we have the indigenous community on the other hand, we have the nonprofit community. They're all working separately, but we don't have facile mechanisms for them to come together and to work together. No one uh, seems to be willing to pick up the leadership for that. I re was recently doing a thing in our central waterfront in Vancouver. We had great ideas. The bottom line was that there is not a governance mechanism that could bring all these people together in order to do something differently. And then secondly, we are never gonna have enough industrial land. We're never gonna have enough housing land. But what we do have is the way to use land differently. We can use it, A, we, we know how to use it more intensively. That's the one thing that we can tell the world about. I tell the world about that constantly. Now we have to consider how to use it in a much more mixed way. And not only that, the city has to become the choreographers for taking things that perform really well in the economy, housing, even, even condos, and how to put them together with the things that don't really perform well in the economy, industry and, other, and startups and things like that. Well, if you can put those things together, you don't subsidize it, it cross-subsidizes. The entire wealth of that development comes into subsidizing it, but the city, through all of its zoning mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, have to insinuate that is in, essentially into the regime. And they do that by creating potential bonuses, by creating all kinds of possibilities to do more if you do the right thing or if you put the right combination of use to, uses together. And that's where I think we have to go as a city now. Number one, we have, I, I was suggesting, for example, with these wonderful leaders in the room that, you know, the city hall needs its own innovative center. It needs its own startup center. It needs its own place to go to reform itself and to use all these people in the room to do that, not just a few people, but to bring in all this talent that's there around the world to say, well, how do we process permits in three months rather than nine months, or rezoning in four months rather than a year and a half. And that's not by deregulating, because someone else said, if you don't have a great place to live, a livable place to live, no one's gonna come here anyway. It's not about deregulating, it's about re refocusing regulation to what we really need, what we really need to do, how we need to do it, and then always doing things that bring the interests of people together so they want to work together, not because they kind of feel like it, but it's in their interest to work together. If we can do that, if we can take those silos, and then we take each of these problems and rethink the problem the same way we've been talking about all day long, we can fix these issues. And when we fix these issues, this will be a dynamo city, because it sits in a dynamo country, it sits in a beautiful natural environment, and it, has a, it already has a brand around the world. I go, I live on that brand <laughs> around the world. But that's, we're at, that's why we're, we're at such a pivotal moment to do that, and that's, that's the steps that I think we need to take. Um, just to, to put it to the other four of you, what are some of those next steps that we are starting to take? And the other, the flip of that is what is that big decision? Because to your point, Vancouver really has been developed and built over big decisions and, and decisions that were bold at the time and now seem completely obvious. Not bringing a highway into downtown if we're thinking about more of a planning side, hosting some, some major world events that were far too big for the size of population we were. So, so maybe to each of you, what are some of those bigger, bolder decisions that we really do have to make outside of the silos? Uh, may, maybe I'll jump in and pass it down. Um, I, I think there's a few of them. Uh, and so I, I know that there was discussion around 
not in the past but the future, so streetcars shape the city, for example. Well, uh, you see the work on the Granville Bridge, those off-ramps are going to come down, we're going to form an H-level street work network. You take down the viaducts, you make a more people-friendly city. I love Larry's idea about innovation and challenging um, city of Vancouver, and, and since we're, you know, I, I'm glad that we're having a very kind of real conversation. We recently um, have moved away from having a separate Vancouver Economic Commission to your point around breaking down silos because we wanted to bring that in in the city. The film commissioner, which has been incredibly successful for Vancouver um, and uplifting Vancouver's film industry and a lot of the creative folks are in the room today, um, sits at City Hall in an effort to break that down. So I think those are the pieces around moving forward and the ability to be bold and actually support our economy. And if I'm gonna you know, nudge the window a little bit too or nudge the envelope, I would say, um, economy is not a four-letter word anymore. I felt like it was. I sat on council last term and we didn't celebrate that. We didn't want to kind of invest and uplift and, and realize that we have the ability to address and support social issues if we have a vibrant, thriving economy in our city. We can't do that if we don't have it. And so it's the, it's the willingness to be open to trying some things and not, um, and this is difficult in government compared to private sector and coming from private sector, but it's to not overanalyze and be willing to fail on some things, but to actually try. Right, so you know, versus we're, we're doing a lot of pilots because that was socially kind of more acceptable. It helped people to visualize. I think we might have some folks from downtown Van in the room when we try a trial of the Granville Promenade. Now with this council, we're like, okay, let's just put forth a bold vision for that public space and look at pedestrianizing that or pedestrianizing Gastown. And so I think a big part of it is around we just need to do it and we need to move on some of these things. We might not get it perfect, um, but we actually just need to take some of those steps. I think you're asking two things, if I'm right. What is What do we want our city to look and feel like, that sort of livability piece of it? And then also, how do you create the conditions to do that? And so the bold thinking, Larry, I couldn't agree with you more, is that you know, I, I represent one of the voices of the business community, and for a long time, it's business versus government. Well, that doesn't work. So you have to bring both sides to the table, and that includes our indigenous partners as well. You bring them to the table to find solutions together, and you stop trying to pit one against the other. So I'll stick maybe more to that side than how you shape the city, because there are social issues that we should talk about as well, but um, I'll stick more to the economic conditions. So what governments need to do is they need to incent businesses, they need to incent investors to invest in our region. They need to create the conditions for businesses to thrive. And that takes bold thinking. It also means backing down on some of their very hard fought positions and recognizing that they might have worked 20 years ago, but they don't work now. And if I take industrial land as an example, you know, there are good re there are food security reasons to have the ALR, for example, and I'm not suggesting we get rid of the ALR, but to look at regional land use planning as a holistic way and to look at it that would support food security, would support food production, would support production, innovation, uh, warehousing, all of it, instead of being done in silos, and to make some really bold decisions, because if you think about some of the decisions that were made in land use planning, they were made in the 1970s. Well, it's not the 1970s anymore, despite some of the fashion we see out there. It's definitely not the same. And when it comes to the economic conditions around the provincial and federal governments, it is unacceptable that we have one of the highest marginal tax rates in the corporate tax rates. It is a global economy and we are competing for talent and we are competing for dollars globally. We need to have that mindset and, and we need government to really pave the way to do that. Yeah, I think, um, so, you know, I totally agree with what Bridget and Sarah are saying around uh, the economy and the importance of that and that it doesn't need to be in opposition to some of the social goals that we want to achieve, that we need a strong economy in order to fund uh, things like affordable housing, social services, and to tackle the big challenges in our city. But I really think we need to, you know, wake up and realize it's 2023 in Vancouver and, you know, we can't have, uh, you know, single family neighborhoods with, you know, big leafy trees and, and no multifamily development, for example. Like, we just can't do that in this city. This is a major city. We have big investments in rapid transit, and we need to be capitalizing on that. We need to be allowing four to six story uh, rental apartments throughout the city, for example. And we need to kind of make a decision and, and really 
uh, strive for the city that we want to be, in order to accommodate everybody that wants to be here, in order to provide housing for people, in order to still make it attractive to, to take that job here that I was talking about earlier, as well as creating an interesting and dynamic city where there are corner stores in your neighborhood, something that was you know, commonplace 100 years ago and is now not allowed in many areas. So I think there's a lot of policy changes that we can make and that we are um, actively looking at in order to reshape our city for, for the time that we're in and also just to accommodate more people and, and create a more dynamic environment. I'm just thinking a little bit about what we have uh, as councillors and, and what kind of tools we have in our toolkit because we are limited, certainly property taxes are not a way for us to be able to, to uh, make major investments. It's really to make sure that we have the, the, the core functioning uh, aspects of the city running. Um, and there are those very big macro issues around poverty, uh, mental health and addictions, and the price of housing that are all completely uh, issues that we're uh, thinking about every day, but we're also having to work very strongly as, as vocal advocates for the city of Vancouver uh, in working with senior levels of government. I think about what we can do um, as council, and, and some of that work has already begun uh, since, uh, since we were sworn in uh, just about a year ago, which is to bring people together and, and, and sort of addressing some of the silos that, uh, that Larry is talking about. I mean, we have uh, uh, now regular meetings with uh, all of our rep representatives of, of our BIAs. So there's about 20 or so uh, different uh, business improvement areas inside of the city of Vancouver. They wanted to have their voice heard, so now we're on, they're a regular part of our calendar. We meet with um, uh, the development industry in the sense that they have representation, they want to be heard, they have a huge amount of at stake in terms of the capital flowing in to try and develop new housing. So we need to have those kind of open and, and, and regular regular uh, candid discussions. Um, I'm pushing to try and make sure that we can work with our not-for-profits and including some of our major leadership from our events. Um, uh, a lot of them coming through COVID had a lot of struggles in terms of uh, losing some of their sponsors. Uh, we had a few uh, events that came together just uh, with a, a very, very tight budgets. But I think that we can uh, bring uh, a lot of those groups together and try and find common cause and how we can uh, accomplish these things. And so I think that's part of the, the, the power of, of council is to be able to listen and bring people together and ultimately speak uh, very loudly and proudly for the city of Vancouver, including working with uh, groups like Frontier Collective and the tech sector to make sure that their voices are heard and then bring everybody together because we're, truthfully, we're not big enough that we uh, can uh, afford to be in our silos and working alone. We have to work together to be able to, to make, uh, to, to, to have those great goals that we're speaking to, which is to make us a global, global center for innovation. I know the, the time is going quite quickly, but a couple of more questions for you. The first one being, you know, in terms of silos and disconnects, uh, Vancouver or the British Columbia region needs to, needs to add 610,000 homes over the next 10 years or in order to catch up to where we need to be in terms of affordability. We're growing by 125 to 150,000 people in the province of BC because rightfully we're really attracting and retaining a lot of the population because of livability. And as you all have pointed out and this, this entire day has discussed is, is the challenges around balance, around li uh, livability, around the quality of life that we have is really one of those points in, in jeopardy. So, so sort of two questions for, e uh, and you can choose which one to, to answer, but the first one is this isn't a unique problem to Vancouver. This is something that we're seeing in every major global market and every global city. Uh, so are there points of inspiration that you can see of something that is going well in another part of, uh, of the region, whether it's from city building, whether it's from collaboration, but where can we draw some inspiration or some places to point to and who's getting some of it right would be the first question. Well, maybe I'll start because um, it seems to be I work everywhere but here, so I might as well talk about that. I have found that the housing issue is probably the toughest of all the issues, the affordability of housing. We don't have very wide definition of housing. In fact, many of our people, as they are housed, are outlaws, and I've said that earlier today. Well, if you go to Madrid, they have a huge, huge uh, uh, collaboration between the private sector and government to deliver nonprofit home ownership. That's ownership where anyone can feel they have a piece of the, of the rock, 
But this whole huge profitability thing that we now take for granted is used to, to subsidize that. Or if you go to Helsinki, they have something called shared housing. And they have been able to bring down the cost of living of an average family by 30% in a very expensive land and housing market. So those are two very, very good examples. And one of the reasons that both of those work, in my opinion, is that there is a culprit here that we're not talking about. And that culprit is called the speculator. The speculator that when you give more development rights, the speculator takes that. Those developers don't often get those, the possibility. They can't deliver because immediately land goes up in value. So what we have to find is how can our system avoid the opportunity of the speculator and keep that wealth in the hands of someone who wants to do something to change the city with you in a collaborative way. Because what you said is so true, Mike. It's got to be a collaboration today. But the private sector side, just as the public sector side, needs a source of funds for that. You know, they have to have basic profits, profits or they don't survive. It's very simple. It's very clear cut. Um, but a lot of that potential of wealth is being taken by the speculator, unless you can do like Helsinki, you get off that bandwagon, or you can do like Madrid, and you find an alternative way to manage that. In Madrid, they do it by a very, very intelligent um, collaboration, which comes right through the regulatory regime. It's, it doesn't come just because we decide to have meetings. It comes because I get more if I do this for you, and it gets better. And I think that's where we really have to head, uh, go, going. The, but there's a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. I just add to that, because those are sort of medium and longer term um, solutions. And one of the short term solutions I'm watching, or potential solution I'm watching very closely, is what New York has done around short term rentals. Also today, they announced a very bold new housing target which is more medium and long term. But let's look at the short term um, issue that we have. We have a lot of short term rentals, not just in Vancouver and not just in Surrey and Burnaby, but you know, in Invermere and in Chase, all over British Columbia, all over the world. As you said, I think it's time for us to rethink that model. Not that they shouldn't exist, but should they be, there should there be so many. And I will give kudos to city council and the mayor for increasing the cost of the permit annually so that it may be it reflects a little bit more of the profit that some people who are the owners of these short-term rentals are taking. But should, should we allow that many short-term rentals when we have a huge crisis when it comes to the rental market for people who want to live and work here? So it is time, I think, that we rethink that model and address it in, in, in a different way. Yeah, maybe I can add to that, and uh, I love how Larry can sort of outlay the concepts globally, and then we can sort of bring it down to what we can do in Vancouver. So maybe it's called, you know, the honey and the vinegar, or the sugar and the spice, choose your term. Um, but some of the things that have worked around how do you incent something differently, uh, rental housing policies in the city of Vancouver, for example, required inclusionary zoning. 20% um, of the units below market, and we've waived development cost fees. What was the result? That in the last couple of years, Vancouver built more rental housing than any time in the last couple of decades. And we did that consciously because we identified that that was the type of housing that was needed, and we provided incentives to do it. Now we're looking at, you know, AHO, affordable home ownership. Larry's referring to the Madrid example. Um, and again, I think there's opportunities to really look at doing that. So it's like, what is the next evolution being inspired by the past, but maybe being doing it differently of what was co-op housing. We know that was uh, successful because at the point in time we had federal government funding that underwrote co-ops. We don't have that now. So how do we create that next thing? Is it the affordable home ownership and what is the trade-off for doing it? I think that there is a balance in that mix. Um, we had some lively discussions amongst our council around the short-term rental fees. You know, should we increase them or not? What's the right balance to do that? Do you disincent people? Do they go underground? Is it fair to do it? But it's also a really important statement that housing is for people. The McGill study that came out recently, I think, really quantified 
to Bridget's point, how significant the tens of thousands of units that were out of the housing market because they were allowed for STR, short-term rental. So I think it's that ability to try it, co-housing, you know, sharing that. I, I was born in the UK, um, and a lot of these types of concepts are not new. They are in North America, but they're not in North America and in other cities. Like, you know, my Nana lived in council housing when I was a kid. It was um, pervasive everywhere in the UK, and so there was just, you knew there were options, and like the people lived in communities, and there were diverse communities with different housing types, standalone. We had, uh, you know, in the UK, you have detached and semi-detached houses. Like, that's happened forever, for decades growing up, and now we're talking just now around the demise of the single-family neighborhood, as Peter mentioned in Vancouver. Oh, the horror. Um, well, right now, people just want a home, right? And uh, so, you know, there's some great questions around trees and park space, and that's important for everybody. Um, but I think it is really around recognizing that some of the other models that we've seen from other places can cause us, I think, to kind of pull our socks up and be a little bold. I was just going to jump in on the affordable home ownership piece. I think it's a huge missing piece, and certainly council has identified that, and we're looking at strategies to address that. But, um, you know, not everybody wants to, to rent for the rest of their life. Many people want to be able to hold, own a home, but right now the prices are not attainable for people, and that's something that's really changed uh, in the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's, it's just not possible for people, even with a very good income, to get into the housing market in Vancouver, plus interest rates, et cetera. So I, I thought what Larry was saying about Madrid was very interesting. I don't know if that's a, a housing corporation that the city runs, but public-private partnership. Public -private partnership. Uh, I think there is certainly a, an opportunity there for us to explore as council in order to facilitate those opportunities for affordable home ownership to help people get into the market, to help people to build equity and wealth. Um, and that will also encourage them to stay in our city as opposed to moving further out to the suburbs. But it, from a policy perspective, there's also co-housing that was mentioned. There's one that opened recently on Main Street. Actually, a friend texted me about it today and said, had you seen this? Then I noticed that one of the units was for sale for $700,000 for one bedroom. So, you know, we're trying. That's one project. But there's no, you know, price uh, guarantee there, right? It's at market prices. And to me, that there needs to be some maybe a covenant or something there. So we are trying things um, and certainly on our radar. Larry, look like you want to jump in. You're the OG. I want to make sure that we get a chance to hear oh, you. No, I just wanted to, in a sense, move the conversation on the same themes, though, to an area of interest to this audience, which is uh, uh, what I would call hospitality to the ideas industries and technology industries, and how do we how do we position ourselves? And I I want to bring another example to the table, and that's from Rotterdam. In Rotterdam, they have a nonprofit development scenario that is allowing them to actually put in place the kind of thing that uh, Dan and others, uh, Cassandra and others want, as almost like a public facility. It's not a public facility, but it's a, some a strange amalgam, and that means that it just opens up all kinds of uh, uh, possibilities for uh, people who can't pay the rent, who can't pay you know the top value rent, and they also do a lot of cross subsidies. You know, some of the, of the uh, businesses can afford to pay more, others are less. They know that, you know, using the co-op model, they know they're coming into that uh, with that scenario. And oftentimes, the wealthy business is more than happy to be a host to the, the startup because what do they do? They get their people from the startup finally. Uh, when, when those startups come, start to come uh, together. And so that's where I'm, when I'm talking about finding ways through the actual, and I'll say this again, the regulatory framework to insinuate that motivation to cross-subsidize and to take land value and development value, um, bring that back into the equation for the public objectives. You know, I don't know if people know, if you do the calculation, the very amount, the value of the development that will occur this year is so vast, uh, and yet all over the world that value is not coming to support the kind of initiatives we're talking about as much as it should. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm just 
thinking of some of those other global examples that you were asking us about, but I also look at, um, again, what we've accomplished as a city. I think of uh, places like the Pearl District in Portland, which is really aspires to be, in some ways, like neighborhoods in the city of Vancouver. I mean, we're incredibly uh, fortunate that we developed the, the West End when we did in the 1950s and 60s to create incredibly livable, livable neighborhoods there. Uh, we've seen how we've had uh, cr increased access to the waterfront that Seattle can only dream of. Um, and so I think we have all the, the pieces of, 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 of fantastic placemaking there. But I think the idea of uh, reaching into ourselves and trying to find policies that are going to uh, allow us to make some of these places more accessible, more attainable, more affordable uh, is uh, really just a, a question of how much imagination we're willing to put into it. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is such a, a big problem. In, uh, it feels insurmountable at this point, but I do believe at the end of the day that we will find a way of overcoming it. I mean, it is now something that we spend almost every waking moment talking about, and eventually uh, we have to, the, somebody has to crack the code and we will start seeing some changes. And I know that as a council, many uh, great ideas are coming to us and we do have great dialogue, and this will be a, a part of that dialogue that we're having with the public as well. So um, I'm optimistic, I always try to remain optimistic. So we started the discussion today uh, really focused on what we have to do to ensure our economic prosperity and very appropriately Bridget and Sarah you both really pointed out that we're at this point of inflection that we need to make the right decisions in order to continue forward on that or really lose the opportunities that are, are in place with us right now. Um, and now that we've run out of time and while there's so many more other questions I'd like to ask I'd like to end by asking what are your asks of this room? Uh, because it has been so collaborative. So what is your, your best advice, just really quickly, advice or ask of this room in terms of making sure that we actually stay on that, that track of prosperity and really start to hit that scorecard? I think um, the fact you're here today and you're interested in the conversations and you're interested in hearing from everybody, all the panels, not just us, um, is very encouraging. I think uh, you're obviously growing your businesses here in Vancouver and that's key for the city's prosperity. Um, we often hear that wages are low in Vancouver and it's really a sunshine tax that we kind of suffer from. People are willing to take lower wages in order to live here. Um, but that's obviously a huge challenge in a city with um, some of the highest housing prices in North America. So I think that the value that you're bringing in terms of developing your businesses here, attracting the right people, uh, brings uh, immense um, value to Vancouver and uh, very appreciative of that. I would, I would say that the organizational side of the whole innovation equation is where this group could help all of us. Because if, what I've been trying to say is we are not organized well for efficient, efficiently moving in the directions that we want to move. And I, I, I've, I believe that we have a city council that is very, very open consciousness. We have a provincial government that is very open consciousness. Even our federal government are open consciousness to doing things in a different way. But part of it is just simply the invention by people like these people who can say, well, you know, we put together a little venture and here's how we arranged it. And here was the governance model and here was the profit model, which we often forget. And we have to learn how to listen to issues of profitability as well because we're in a free economy. So I've, I would think the amazing innovation in organizational arrangements that are here and then put that together with the attitude of innovation that can be brought into the fundamental uh, uh, um, uh, regulatory problems that we face in government, local government. Well, first I'd say keep going. You guys are doing great work. But I'd also say stop thinking of yourselves as being separate from the rest of us in the business community. We're all tech companies. We're all tech now. And so we all need to mobilize and come together. That's how you get change, is you speak with a unified voice. So I'd say find opportunities to create connections and relationships outside of the traditional tech industry. Look for people like myself who work with a very broad base of businesses right across Metro Vancouver and let us help you amplify your message because that's how you're gonna see changes. But mostly, keep going. Um, 
Yeah, I, w I would say, well, first of all, hat tip to Frontier Collective uh, because I think you're doing it um, and you're bringing, you, you know, the collaboration, the organization, bringing people together. Um, so I would, I would echo Bridget saying keep doing what you're doing. Challenge us. Um, we're not afraid to have the difficult conversations. Tell us how we can enable and support. Tell us how we can break down the issues and the barriers and get out of the way because our job should not, we should not be an impediment and we should not be between kind of a positive outcome and opportunity, we should be actually helping to enable. And so I think that um, we want to hear the innovation, the ideas, because it's this room and it's all the industries that are going to bring that forward. It's our job to listen to those. Um, and I think, too, that it's this power of collectiveness. And so I think of the, one of the indigenous words I learned that just stayed with me it was uh, natsamat, um, meaning that we are one, and we are. And I think if we think that we are one city, we are one collective, we are one people, we can go really far if we take that approach. Yeah. My mic. Uh, you know, there was a time when uh, we were often referred to as a backwater here in the city of Vancouver, and I think um, there was good reason for that. But we've now had two sort of major global events in, in the past generation, Expo, uh, the 2010 Games and uh, Olympics, and that brought just people here and attracted so much attention to us here. Um, and. Uh, all of you, I think, are, are uh, stand to uh, to really build upon the, the an incredible legacy that began here with technology, with uh, uh, film, entertainment, music, uh, and culture. And I, I, I would say that it takes a certain kind of kind of madness to 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 do what you do. But I think uh, it, we're so much better for it. And uh, if you're uh, half as dog as dogged as, as Dan and Cassandra and the others from the Frontier Collective, I know that we're going to go uh, great places together. And uh, we're here as a council in part and way to kind of get out of your way, but also we're here to listen. And, and, and we, all of us want to hear your stories and find a way that we can connect you with other people in the community and try and uh, bring your good ideas into the forefront. So uh, I think we've got a huge, amazing possibilities before us. And uh, again, we all love of Vancouver, so let's build upon and, and use that energy to drive a huge innovation. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Really great.